It's a pleasure to be joined today by Pascal Santaman, Director of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD in Paris. We would like to thank him for taking time out of his schedule within weeks of a G20 meeting of finance ministers in which he will participate to speak to us today on the ever more topical issue of taxing the ever expanding digital economy. Before the talk, some brief biographical information. A French national, Pascal joined the OECD in 2007 and has been in his current high profile role since 2012. He spent the first decade of his career as an official in the French finance ministry where he held various positions, including heading the supervision of EU work on direct taxes, overseeing legislation and policy on wealth tax and mergers, and leading international tax treaty negotiations. He is a graduate of the highly prestigious Ecole Nationale d'Administration. Pascal will speak to us for about 25 minutes or so, and then we will go to a Q&A with our audience. Submit questions and comments via the Q&A function on Zoom, and please type in your affiliation so that you can be identified. If you are tweeting, you might also type at IIEA into your tweet. Today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. With that, thank you, Pascal. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, good uh, afternoon uh, to all of you. Um, very happy to be with you, even though, as usual now, unfortunately, very frustrating not to meet in person. The interaction is not the same, but uh, we do what we can. So very happy to be back uh, to Ireland uh, and, and uh, happy to brief you on the latest on our project, where we stand and, uh, and what's next. Um, maybe to start with um, some, I mean, to set the scene, some retrospective view on, on where, why we are where we are today. Um, and I would say that uh, all that is linked to another big crisis, the global financial crisis, 2008. So it's uh, now around uh, 10 years that uh, things uh, have been changing in international tax because the global financial crisis, I think, uh, triggered uh, some form of change of paradigm in international taxation. International taxation um, had <clears throat> been quite uh, quiet uh, for decades since uh, 1928 and the League of Nations Model Tax Convention. And uh, the, the policy, the international tax policy was actually left to uh, tax treaty negotiators or transfer pricing people who were all uh, working within the box, within the frame, the, which had been fixed by the League of Nations and then uh, by states, by governments in their bilateral treaties. 2008 is something like a wake-up call that there has been globalization, financialization, the uh, suppression of most of the obstacles for uh, free trade and uh, the, the offer of financial services. And as a, as a result of globalization, without any form of tax coordination, the number of governments realized that there was an issue with tax avoidance, with tax fraud, tax fraud from individuals, tax avoidance from companies, and that something had to be done. And the reason why they thought so um, um, intensely that something had to be done is that to pay for the crisis, to buy out the international, uh, the, the financial institutions, they had to put a lot of money on the table, and this was public money, and they realized that they were putting a lot of public money, in other words, uh, money coming from the collection of taxes, to help banks, which had helped taxpayers not to pay their taxes because of offering uh, bank secrecy. So you, you, you had this, this moment of, of awareness, of, of um, wake, waking up, kind of, uh, and the G20, which has been established precisely to manage all that, telling the OECD Act. We did the first phase, which was attacking bank secrecy, fiduciary secrecy, making sure that there would be tax coordination. The second phase started in 2012 with what we have called the BEPS project in Ireland. I don't need to spell out BEPS, you know what it is. So we launched that um, and we delivered in 2015. Now, one can say uh, good things or not as good things as I would like on, on BEPS. Uh, there are some successes. There are some things which probably didn't work as well as they should have. But for sure, uh, I would think that we had a change of paradigm of, of the, the tax behavior of multinational companies, of the tax behavior of 
of uh, tax administrators and of the fact that uh, politicians all over the world um, got interested and actually sometimes excited about uh, international tax. Um, what we left open in 2015 when delivering the BEPS package, the 15 reports, was precisely on, on action one. You may remember that when we started BEPS, we said, and it was uh, somewhere in the chapeau of the action plan, we are not going to touch on the allocation of taxing work. That's something that uh, BEPS is, is not going to uh, tackle. Uh, BEPS is about closing down loopholes. BEPS is about uh, the elimination of double non-taxation, uh, but it's not about the reallocation of taxing work. But the Action 1 report, uh, which was about uh, the digital economy, uh, actually brought some interesting conclusions. Uh, one of the conclusions was there is no such thing as the digital economy. We should not ring fence the digital economy, but instead address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And we at the OECD were very keen to keep that, that expression, that sentence uh, intact, because uh, we think it's indeed a question which goes much uh, beyond uh, a few companies. Uh, by the way, when you try to draw the border, it's, it's not really easy. The um, second uh, main conclusion uh, that few people actually saw was about the fact that uh, the challenges of the digitalization of the economy were more related to a question of taxing right allocation rather than a BEPS type of measure. So we said at the end um, of the Action 1 report, one, we cannot ring fenced. Two, BEPS is going to address part of it. You may remember, especially in Ireland, that a number of these tech companies, very successful, very large um, uh, companies, were able to benefit something like double exemption, uh, Ireland is well known for offering uh, some menus or some sandwiches on the menu of the tax offer. So uh, you, you, you had bets obviously used by these companies with two trillion US dollars of <clears throat> accumulated profit of US companies in Bermuda, most of them being channeled through Ireland or through Luxembourg or through the Netherlands. So the, 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 the first Immediate conclusion of the BEPS action plan uh, one was uh, let's wait and see what uh, the implementation of the BEPS measures uh, will, will, will do. <clears throat> but you also had this point to say that there is an issue and this issue is about nexus <clears throat> and profit allocation. And that we don't deal. <clears throat> and especially as the US at that time was not in a position to agree a work stream on this. That's where we left it. Then we established the inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. We had some uh, institutional work to do to make sure that we would have inclusivity, that we would have a process of implementing the BEPS measures, negotiating the multilateral convention, um, uh, the, the so-called multilateral instrument, the MLI. So many things going on, but the frustration of many countries, not all, but many, I would say most countries, about uh, taxing digital activities was growing. Um, so much as uh, the German finance minister, Mr. Schäuble, when he took over the G20 presidency from China in 2017, he said, and that was the meeting of the finance ministers in Baden-Baden in February, we need to do something, let's mandate the OECD to produce another report. We cannot wait till 2020. So, we started another report, and what was quite um, surprising, um, unexpected, let's say, was the fact that uh, while the US new administration, the Trump administration, was negotiating the US tax reform with Congress, we could see an opening from the US. I wouldn't have bet much on an opening from the US under a Trump administration, which is not necessarily a great supporter of multilateralism, uh, that we, we, we would have an opening and we actually got the opening, which was to work on a um, solution. This is what we started in 2018. We issued a report and 
following exchanges because um, many countries, I mean, you had different buckets of countries. You had one, com one, one set of countries saying, there is an issue, we need to address it, but it cannot be ring fenced to the digital economy. It's about the nexus, but more fundamentally, it's about a profit uh, allocation um, uh, issue that we need um, to work out. And, and, and let's do that. And I think we could put in that category China or, or the US, or the US leading and, and China being, being aligned. We had the second bucket of, of countries saying, well, actually, it's a, it's a digital issue. It's nothing else but a digital issue. And as a result, uh, we want a digital solution, solution focused on digital. And third bucket of countries, um, which largely included countries which until then thought there was no issue and no need to discuss anything, joined a slightly different position to say, we may recognize that there is uh, an issue, but, but, but there is no urgency and, and, and we're not necessarily keen on addressing it. Um, I would put Ireland definitely in that, in that category. Throughout 2018 and 2019, we worried this out uh, in the G7, in the G20, in the inclusive framework um, uh, at the OECD, including 137 countries on an equal footing through the task force on the digital economy, the different working parties. And out of that emerged the idea early in 2019 that we should have what we've called a two pillar approach. One pillar being revisiting nexus and profit allocation and one pillar being uh, establishing a global minimum tax to put a floor, at least, to the race to the bottom, to limit uh, tax competition to uh, a threshold which would be globally agreed. This idea being uh, derived from the US tax reform and in particular the uh, GILTI, a Global um, um, Intangible Low Income Tax. This idea of a two-pillar approach was agreed without prejudice, because that meant the negotiation was going on, and that there was something like a package, some countries being more interested in pillar two, some countries being more interested in pillar one, and all agreeing that we should advance this uh, agenda together. Through thousand, uh, through, uh, throughout 2019, uh, work um, uh, advanced, uh, but we were stuck on pillar one, with this divide between basically the US, China, saying it cannot be ring fenced, uh, plus some other countries, the third bucket I mentioned too, tended to join that view, <clears throat> and the large um, uh, EU continental countries, uh, namely France, um, uh, Italy, Spain, um, at, at that time, the UK, which was still in the European Union, even though not continental, uh, saying we should do something digital and digital only because what is new with the digitalization of the economy are the business models uh, relying on uh, users' contribution. So we should be able to amend international tax rules to capture user contributions value creation. There is value created by uh, the user contribution, <clears throat> either through platforms uh, like Airbnb and so, or through a, an advertisement model like uh, Google or Facebook, and, and the focus was on that. And, and 2019 was, was a debate between uh, these two categories of countries, and, 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 and we, 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 we couldn't unlock the negotiation. That's why the OECD Secretariat propose, and that's not that usual, to try to come up with a compromise uh, proposal, uh, which we call the unified approach, unifying the different views expressed on Pillar 1, and in particular, on the scope of Pillar 1. And you may have seen that the unified approach propose a three-tier um, uh, architecture, uh, first tier being for the companies <clears throat> dealing with uh, digital activities but also for consumer-facing businesses, which reflected the views expressed by the US of, of a marketing intangible approach. So we said for that scope, we should have an allocation of the uh, residual profit to be defined, let's say 
uh, both 10% of, of, of the return, uh, but, but the rate were to be uh, negotiated. But above a, a certain level of profitability, a percentage of the residual um, uh, return, one could say the excess profit, one could say the rent, I mean, whatever language you use, we, we, we understand what we're talking about. A percentage of that, 10, 20, whatever, should be allocated to the market jurisdiction. And that's the change uh, of, of um, the approach there, moving from existing transfer pricing to something which uh, is new and is based on a formula. And there was consensus on, on this overall um, approach. <clears throat> Noting that, of course, this would take place with a new nexus rule. The new nexus being you can be taxable when you're a foreign company in a country, even if you don't have a permanent establishment. The idea being that a sustained engagement in the jurisdiction would be good. What would be the sustained engagement? Most countries thought that a person, I mean, a, a, a certain level of turnover could characterize a, a new nexus. And some countries said we would need additional factor, but the conversation was there. We also proposed a um, second layer, which was a fixed return for um, uh, routine distribution activities. And that was mainly for the benefits of developing countries and for the benefits of tax certainty. And the third layer, which was about tax certainty, to say if we have a new reallocation of taxing rights to the market jurisdiction, the market jurisdiction should provide for better uh, tax certainty. Tax certainty which could be improved by agreeing as early as possible the amount A, the first layer, but tax certainty being also in case of a dispute to have something binding, compulsory, unlike mutual agreement procedure, which as you know, <clears throat> are just about countries endeavoring to eliminate double taxation. We tabled that, we had I think pretty good uh, reception uh, by most countries, but uh, the uh, US Secretary uh, for Treasury um, expressed uh, the idea that uh, this was fine, but going to Congress to move away from the arms length principle, moving away from the current definition of the permanent establishment would prove too much of a challenge. And he said, we should move towards this approach, but on a safe harbor approach. And he further clarified that safe harbor meant that companies would decide whether they would be in the scope or not of this new approach. And, and, and in what he explained to uh, other countries, uh, he said, well, we may have the existing system, uh, but companies would be pushed towards the new system to the extent that the new system will provide more certainty. So the certainty may be a good incentive for companies to go. So it's not, I have the choice to pay taxes or not, but I have the choice between two regimes, one of them providing more uh, certainty, even though this regime would provide more uh, uh, taxing rights to uh, um, jurisdictions, market jurisdictions. <clears throat> this, to say the least, was not very much welcomed by uh, US partners. Uh, and it was decided after many exchanges and at the inclusive framework in January to move this um, uh, issue of safe harbor to when we would look at the implementation. So in January, the inclusive framework said, okay, we endorse the unified approach. We work on pivot two. There was no such thing as unifying pivot two. And we are going to develop all that technically with a program of work that everybody thought would uh, not be developed on time because it's quite a challenge to write new rules which are completely, I mean, outside uh, the box. We were there in the spring where COVID uh, knocked the door and uh, obliged us to confine, to speak via Zoom and other means and not to be able to meet, which clearly uh, is a hurdle. Uh, negotiating uh, through Zoom is not easy. Working with the team, working within the Secretariat is fine. We know each other, we know how to work together. Negotiating is something else because you need to give something up in exchange of something else, but, but you cannot do that in a plenary. Usually you do that in the lobby, you do that in the, in the, at the dinner before the negotiation or at the breakfast or at a coffee break. And uh, what I like saying is Zoom is fantastic, but they don't provide 
the coffee and and without uh, the coffee break you cannot really advance the negotiation so we've been delayed and instead of delivering in july we said we would deliver in october here we are we are two weeks three weeks before the uh, g20 finance ministers meeting uh, on the 14th of october what have we done we have developed what we have called blueprints and the G20 finance ministers expressed um, support to uh, uh, this uh, idea of providing them with blueprints at their October meeting. This uh, G20 statement was issued in July, a virtual meeting of the G20. So um, we have developed a blueprint for Pillar 1 and a blueprint for Pillar 2. Now, the blueprints are technical pieces of work. They are technical to the extent that we've explored how you would uh, determine the residual profit, the uh, questions related to sourcing the income, the question of, of defining uh, the tax base, the question of defining what is a distribution uh, routine, routine distribution activity, the design of the tax certainty, both in uh, uh, the dispute prevention on amount A, how can you agree through a panel like ICAP, um, the um, amount among uh, interested tax administrations and how would you design something which would be compulsory, which would be binding, but which would not be arbitration as this is a red line for many countries. So we've developed all that and technically we've tried to advance as much as we could, including on the scope, which we understand has been since the beginning, the tricky part with the US saying no ring fencing uh, and with other countries saying, let's do ring fencing and, and, and the unified approach proposing this. And then the US with a safe harbor saying, well, we, we don't really know how to handle uh, this unless we let companies to decide. So we, we've tried to see what uh, ADS, uh, automated digital services, uh, could be uh, defined. Uh, we try to define what consumer facing businesses would be and what the issues would be in terms of, of business line segmentation and so business line segmentation. How do you do a business line segmentation? How do you avoid doing business line segmentation, which could be heavily um, 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 costly in terms of, of um, um, compliance costs. So um, we did all that work and the end result or the current result is a set of um, uh, chapters, uh, 10 chapters, 450, maybe more pages of technical work. That's the blueprint on Pillar 1. Just to show that we're serious guys, we do the work and the work has been done with the working parties. Now, the, 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 the downsides of this blueprint uh, is that some of the key political decisions, the key political parameters, what will at the end be the scope like. Uh, what are the quanta? By quanta I mean uh, how do you define the residual profit? How much of the residual profit would you allocate to the market uh, jurisdictions? Uh, the level and the extent of tax certainty. All these questions are bundled, <clears throat> they're linked, and countries would not disclose their position. If I'm India, I will not say I'm ready to take this or that type of tax certainty if I don't know what the nexus rule will be and if I don't know what the amount will be transferred to India. So you can see that, that you have something like a blockage in terms of disclosing all the elements so that you, you conclude the negotiation. And that's a bit where we are. In other words, we have something which is almost ready for use, except that some of the key parameters need to be solved. And we heard in Ju June from the US that the US, because of the proximity of the US election, would not be keen on reaching an agreement on the 14th of October when you have a US election um, a couple of weeks later. So the US clearly said, we are interested, we are not pulling out of the negotiation, unlike what the FT uh, reported more than once. That was not correct. Um, fake news, I would say. <clears throat> they didn't pull out of the negotiation, but they said, mm, we, we don't necessarily want an agreement. Now, even though in July at the G20 finance minister's meeting, they let the door open. And even in the letter, which is not a public letter from Minister uh, Secretary Minuchin, uh, it doesn't exclude an agreement by year. So there is clearly a level of uncertainty 
uh, there. And that's why today I would struggle to tell you what kind of agreement we'll reach on the 14th of October because ministers are now talking to each other. As regards to Peter II, things were slightly easier to the extent that there was no unified approach. We just had to develop this technically. And wow, it's a challenge. It's extremely difficult. It's very complex, um, <clears throat> like Peter I. And we've advanced a blueprint with the same idea that technically, if we had to do a pivot two, if we had to design a global minimum tax with an income inclusion rule, with an under tax payment rule, with blending, with carve out, with all the elements, including uh, the possibility of a switch over rules and subject to tax rules, what should they look like from a technical perspective? And technical group have come up uh, the technical groups have come up with uh, the design of what uh, Pivot 2 could be. We today have two blueprints which have been sent to the inclusive framework, which will be meeting on the 8th and 9th of October. Um, and this will be reported to the G20. I can tell you right now that <clears throat> we'll go public. I mean, we will go public, no, not you, uh, the people who had leaked and, and who tried to make it public. Uh, we, well, we will go public with all the inputs from all the members of the inclusive framework and we've already incorporated the first set of comments from the full inclusive framework members and now we are moving to a second round of comments on both pillars. Uh, we are going to uh, present these publicly on the 12th of October uh, and this will be discussed the G, by the G20 finance ministers on the 14th of October. What's next? Depends. It depends on the level of agreement. It depends on the political dynamic. You have some countries <clears throat> very much interested in Peter II. Germany is one of them. You have the US supporting Peter II. You have some countries, Ireland, uh, I think it would be no surprise to say that I would anticipate that Peter I, you don't necessarily like much, but you can cope with, while Peter II, you don't like, full stop. So how, how will the political dynamic in Europe and elsewhere articulate to be seen. But what I could expect is one, that's easy, it's almost decided, we will go for public consultation of the two blueprints um, in October. Uh, the level of consultation may not be the same, <clears throat> depending on the level of agreement on both, but it was already decided that we would go on pillar two for public consultation on the simplification and administration measures. On pillar one, there are many technical aspects which definitely will gain from public input. Um, so that's something we'll do probably till the end of the year. Second, and as is the case on many of the fronts, we will be waiting for the US election. Uh, it's important to know will, what uh, the new administration will be. Uh, uh, is it a renewed Trump administration, a Biden administration? And I would add uh, what majority in Congress divided Congress, united Congress, aligned with the White House or not. So you have different scenario that uh, I think US partners will have to play with and will have <clears throat> to wait uh, for feedback from the US administration, again, even uh, a renewed Trump administration. Uh, and then we should know, we should hear from them quite quickly or the Biden administration that will take time because you have a transition period and then the time for them to appoint uh, new delegates will, will take some more time. Even though I understand that uh, everybody in the US now understands that this is an important topic which uh, doesn't come last. I mean, it's, it's, it's a topic which now is on the radar screen of politicians and will be on the radar screen of whatever new administration uh, we have in the US. Beyond that, uh, you may have seen the European Union uh, speaking about that. There was an informal ECOFIN, and I know finance ministers talked about that, uh, with a question of the OECD may fail to deliver a full-fledged full response to uh, uh, the issue by the end of the year. Uh, but again, the circumstances which I have described may explain that, COVID, proximity of the US election. What do they do? Uh, they said, and that was the mission statement of Madame von der Leyen, the president of the EU Commission, we, we are going to act if the OECD fails. Now the circumstances are slightly different, but she said in her State of the Union address a few days ago, we may propose something early in the year. And I think Mr. Gentiloni publicly said 
yesterday or, or on Friday that the EU will, will act, but, but giving some time at the OECD to, to resume the negotiation and, and show what's happening uh, there. So you can see that, that there is a dynamic in, in Europe, uh, there is a dynamic in the, in the US. Uh, we for sure at the OECD, we think that we now have a very solid basis for finalizing the negotiation when we have leadership, when we have leadership from the US on the digital topic, when we have leadership from European countries, or at least those which sponsor the uh, global minimum tax, uh, when they act together, which I think they are currently uh, doing, we'll see what uh, the um, um, future will look like in terms of pillar one, in terms of pillar two, and in terms of the link between pillar one and pillar two, which so far have been a package, politically, a package, while technically, policy-wise, it's not a package. I mean, you have pillar one, you have pillar two, and, and, and they're not really linked. They're linked politically because uh, different governments made that link. That's where we are, so you know almost as much as I do, and uh, I will be happy to take questions. Good, thank you very much. I think that brought us all uh, very much up to speed with how things are going. Could I start off by asking um, about the earlier evolution of uh, the, the multi multilateralization of this? You, you mentioned that up until between 1928 and 2008, uh, bilateralism dominated the dealing, the dealing the countries dealing with this, and then it moved into a, a multilateral framework. At a time when we talk so much about the decline of multilateralism, do you think that your work and the, the countries involved with you around the world, this is actually goes contrary to that claim that in fact multilateralism is alive and well? You're muted. Thank yeah, you. uh, that's a good question. And I would think that tax, I mean, you have something like a tax paradox. There. The global financial crisis, I think, started that process of financial crisis followed by a fiscal crisis, followed by a social crisis, followed by a political crisis. And, and you can see that in so many countries. And the, and the political crisis, which, which follows all, all that cycle, is largely about bringing nationalistic uh, parties to the, to the power, to the governments, or, or not far. Including in the, in the different, uh, among the people, uh, this, this feeling of, of we need to fight back globalization and so is, is largely shared. Ireland probably being an exception there because you've so much benefited from globalization. Um, but in continental Europe, uh, you can see it in the UK. I mean, I think we can see it uh, more clearly than everywhere, anywhere else. So you, you have that cycle. And the tax paradox, I think, is that tax is at the core of sovereignty. And countries want to protect their sovereignty. The people want to be sovereign again. They don't want to leave it up to the European Union for the UK or to, to whatever international organization elsewhere. But in the area of tax, <clears throat> if you don't coordinate, if you don't practice multilateralism, you actually undermine your sovereignty. In other words, in a global economy, if a government wants to stick to its local sovereignty without any interaction with the others, this sovereignty will remain nominal, but not real, because it will be undermined by the tax offer of investment hubs, of small open economies. And large countries, and I would recognize that it's partly a large versus small country debate, the large countries understood that it was their interest to cooperate, to have multilateralism, to protect their own sovereignty. So in a sense, and that's the paradox, Multilateralism supports the um, uh, strengthening of tax sovereignties. And that's why, in spite of this crisis, what we have seen is us building strong international multilateral instruments, the MLI, the uh, MAC, uh, I could, could 
could name a couple of others, and strong institutions, multilateral institutions. The Global Forum on Transparency, 167 members. The Inclusive Framework, 137 members. And not to do a talk show, to do peer reviews. And peer review is something, a peer review is something a bit intrusive because you have peers looking at your system and evaluating you against the standard. But this has worked. Now, we are reaching or we have reached the peak of, of I mean, the peak, we'll see what future looks like, but, but I think we can say that we've reached a level of, of, of pretty strong feeling against multilateralism. And in spite of that, the US has not pulled out of our negotiation and countries are engaged. It is true that we have hiccups. We have a number of countries thinking of or having introduced digital service taxes. I didn't mention the DSTs in my presentation, but the background of this multilateral action uh, were a number of DSTs discussions. Uh, in Europe, it didn't succeed, but in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Australia, in Turkey, in Korea, in, in many other countries where you have either measures introduced or or government saying they will introduce measures. So that's the background, but which is also part of a negotiation. Uh, we, we, we want to weigh in the negotiation. We want to have our views uh, reflected, and if not, we'll act unilaterally. So uh, it's part of it. So to, to make it short, um, yes, multilateralism is in crisis. Yes, it does translate with some forms of hiccups in, in our negotiation, but fundamentally, we have built something strong, which I think is strong enough to resist this crisis of multilateralism. And, and the real basis for this is that protecting tax sovereignties requires some form of tax coordination. Could I ask just how big a problem this is? Because when I speak to my French friends or my German friends, I, I get the impression often from them that they believe the tax revenues, the actual amount of money being collected by their treasuries from profit tax is falling. But I always cite your organization's database and that if you look at corporation tax revenues over the decades, relative either to total tax take or relative to GDP, you don't see any change. So well, if, if you if you read yeah if you read our surveys well you will see that uh, the, st the relative stability of corporate income tax revenues in countries uh, is a problem because the increase of the profitability of the largest multinational companies on the one hand um, but also the uh, uh, increase of incorporations of, of uh, activities which were not incorporated earlier should have translated into an increase of corporate income tax. So you have a gap, uh, you have something which has been lost, one. Two, in our evaluation, which was the most conservative possible of BEPS, we, we were at uh, a quarter trillion every year. So this is not anecdotal. I can tell you that our findings were much, much higher. <coughs> but the members told us, hey, let's not create expectation. Let's take the, the hypothesis, which will uh, yield the smaller amount possible. So we are probably in half a trillion than, than a quarter trillion. Um, third, I would agree that um, if you talk about digital, it's clearly not what is going to pay for COVID. Obviously not. The amounts at stake are not that big. Even the European Union in what they have estimated for the DST was a few units of billions. I don't know whether it was three, four billion, but, but something which is uh, very limited. So it's not digital which will pay for the crisis, but the overall regulation or fight against tax avoidance has several hundreds of billions um, at stake. And that's where a global minimum tax in our estimates, and we've made that public, and there will be a public assessment released on the 12th of October as well. But we are in the range of um, more than 50 billion a year, and, and probably more than that. So that's something worldwide. That's something which is significant uh, on pillar two. And pillar one is not about increasing the, 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 the size of, of the pie. Pillar one is about uh, redistribution. It's, it's no longer about companies paying taxes nowhere, the double non-taxation. BEPS has 
put an end to that. And in Ireland, you've seen an increase of your GDP of 26% a couple of years ago because of the onshoring of activities, which uh, so far had been um, uh, booked, if not happening, in Bermuda and elsewhere. So um, it's almost embarrassing. I mean, the, the increase of GDP and the increase of corporate income tax uh, is not necessarily the, the best news for, for IMN because it shows that, that there is a lot of uh, things uh, happening uh, there. So um, um, period one is about a reallocation. It's, redis it's distributional. But even in the redistribution role of pillar one, what do we see? One, that the overall revenue would increase because today part of the residual profit is still booked in low tax jurisdictions where it should ne not necessarily be booked in terms of tax policy. So there is not only a redistribution of around 100 billion from countries to other countries, but also an increase of the revenue collected. And when you combine pillar one and pillar two, you have something which is significant, even though some countries, developing countries, may say, well, is there enough for us to, 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 to go to that very complex system? And maybe the months we have in front of us waiting for the US to be back to the negotiation may allow us to think of, of how we could streamline uh, all this. Maybe a follow-up question. Uh, Dermot O'Leary, an economist with Goodbody, a stockbroker, has modeling been done on the potential economic and fiscal implications in the various countries of different proposals? Can you comment on that? And uh, Professor Frank Barry from Trinity College asks uh, for a clarification on minimum tax. Is it per country or per company? The blueprint um, will describe what is contemplated, but the end result will be decided by members. So it's too early to say what the um, uh, end result of the negotiation will look like. But on pillar two, I think that the sponsors who have strong views on that uh, would say that the blending would or should be um, uh, per jurisdiction, so not, not per company, but per jurisdiction, uh, versus a global blending, which is uh, the current uh, guilty, uh, where you have uh, the average effective tax rate looked at putting all together all the uh, non-US um, companies of, of the group, uh, subsidiaries of the group. So the blending would be, I think, um, uh, jurisdictional, even though this is not yet decided, like other parameters. The reason why I refer to the strong views of the promoters is that on pillar two, what you need to understand is we do multilateral action, but countries could actually move on their own, as the US did with guilty. So you do not need, unlike pillar one, a multilateral instrument, maybe a multilateral instrument would be better for the coordination of the rules, the income inclusion rule and the under tax payment rule. But we think it's not absolutely necessary. So countries can move on their own. They will be much more effective, much more um, um, yeah, effective if you have a significant group of countries moving together. But after all, the subset of countries can do pillar two. And I'm saying that because if there is no agreement on some of the key parameters, or some countries say we are not interested in that, if you have a coalition of the willing large enough to have an impact, you may have it. And, and, and that, in terms of negotiation, is, is something to be taken into account. Now, the first question, if I remember, was on the positions of the different countries. Um, I, I've, I've more or less described them, right? I mean, the US, I think, uh, is one, if we look at the fundamentals, and that's not a given, um, given the environment, the US is supportive of a multilateral solution. The US business community said it, the US government said Pascal, it. Pascal, could I just interrupt? I, I think the question was more in terms of a specific example. What percentage of existing corporation tax could Ireland, for instance, stand to lose under various proposals? Could it be a 10% decline? Could it be a 50% decline? Could it have no effect? Could it actually increase? That's, I think, right. was the 
That's true. Okay. Uh, then you need to ask um, the other Pascal, uh, Donahue. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, an internal discussion. We have made estimates that we've provided to the members for them to work with their own data. And the members told us you can share global estimates, but please don't share our specific data because we're working on them and, and, and we may have our own views or our own way of communicating. So I will not uh, be in a position to disclose country specific data. Uh, oh. But but you feel free to to discuss this with uh, your government. Ireland, I mean, I think it's no surprise to say so, is not a winner of this reform. Uh, that's that's I mean uh, quite uh, intuitive to think so. Okay, okay. Um, former finance minister Alan Jukes asks. Um, assume that the EU adopts a digital tax system, and that the US, the UK, Singapore, China, and Hong Kong do not. I How will it affect the EU's competitiveness? And also a question, just a very small more statement. Farchi Akbar joins us from Indonesia. I think the first time we've had somebody joining us from, from that country, um, asks, or poses the point, do countries have the right not to tax digital co companies? Okay, uh, very different questions. The first question is about taxing digital. As I explained to you, what we are doing at the OECD is not about taxing digital. It's about renovating the international system so that we can address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And if there is an agreement, which I hope and um, uh, think will happen, uh, we will allow countries to levy corporate income tax on these activities. So there is no such thing as taxing digital. When, when, when one talks about taxing digital is by default, in case the OECD fails, you may have digital service taxes, as you have in France, in Italy, in Spain, uh, in the UK, going through uh, Parliament. Uh, and, and if you have a DST, you indeed have a specific dedicated taxation of gross income through a tax on turnover, right? Now, if the question is, if some countries move and if the European Union establishes a DST, is there a risk of leakage of activities outside the EU? Well, if you do a DST, I'm not sure, because a DST is based on turnover, and you will always have clients, uh, whether it's taxed or not. The question is the incidence. Who is going to bear the tax burden? And you will have seen that Amazon recently, I think, said in the UK that uh, the tax will be passed on to the, to the, to the consumers. Uh, and uh, also Google and Facebook increased the uh, um, um, price of advertisement to incorporate the uh, uh, DST uh, in, in the price, uh, the invoice. So um, I think the question is not that much Europe losing competitiveness, because that's, that's not the point there. The point is more whether these taxes are good taxes or not. And I think there is consensus. These are not good taxes. But the real question, and that's something Ireland, I think, needs to understand. You're very good at understanding DSTs are bad. But what you need to understand is what's, what's the alternative? The alternative is a global solution. Great. But if the global solution doesn't come, what do you do? I mean, what's the signal of, of Europe to the rest of the world? We, 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 we can see uh, massive activities deployed on our territories. The rules, everybody agrees, should be changed because... There should be a new nexus and there should be new profit allocation rules, but nothing changes. So there is something wrong. There is something broken. How do you fix it? And, and, and in the fixing of it, you need to have a conversation between Europe and, and uh, other, other countries, including the US or China or emerging economies. So I think that's, that's the uh, real issue. Sorry, the second question from Indonesia, if you don't mind. Well, should countries have the right not to tax digital companies if they choose to? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not sure what it means not to tax. It means that you exempt companies. For the time being, you don't tax because you cannot tax companies because of the uh, taxing rights you get from treaties or you don't get. You don't get the right to tax a company which has no permanent establishment on your territory. So you may be happy with the current situation. In that case, 
you wait. But if rules change, they will change globally. And it would be quite surprising that you would refuse to tax when you have a jurisdiction to tax. Now, uh, if you have a jurisdiction to tax, you could exempt the tech companies, but I think this would be distortive. That would not be fair competition. Uh, you can always do tax incentives, but frankly speaking, not sure it's the right sector to provide tax incentives should you have the right to tax. Finally, you're absolutely allowed not to introduce a DST if there is no global solution. My colleague, uh, Dara Moriarty, wonders if the recent appointment of an Irish person to the head of the Eurogroup and another Irish person to the financial services job at the European Commission, whether those appointments could impact the European position, the EU position on, um, in the talks. I work at the OECD, not at the European Union, so I'm not the best place to respond to that question, but uh, I would just like to congratulate uh, both of them, and in particular Pascal Donahue, who's done a fantastic job as finance minister, and who's regularly in contact with the OECD, with my secretary general, with myself, he follows all that very closely. Now, what will be the impact of him being the chair of the Eurogroup on all this? I don't know, this is uh, high politics and, and there shouldn't be an immediate impact on, on, on that because the link is not obvious, is it? Oh, okay, so Ray Lydon, who's an economist at the Central Bank here, uh, compliments you on your presentation. Uh, he asks this question, can I get clarity on the timings of the public consultations of the blueprints? He says, as I understand it, it's P2, the minimum tax this year, but after October. And P1 depends on the US administration, but it is likely sometime in early 2021. Is no, that I think, I, I, I think we will probably go for public consultation on both pillars. The, the level of questions on each pillar may vary. The uh, target or the focus of the questions may vary from one pillar to another. Uh, but we will go for both uh, mid-October, uh, probably asking for comments by uh, December before Christmas, something like that. And Mark McNulty, I'm not sure his affiliation, he didn't mention it. Here's his question. An OECD draft leaked in recent days suggests that OECD members will be asked to agree to exempt the United States guilty, G-I-L-T-I, regulations from Pillar 2. Does this development suggest a clear choice between a U.S. veto ending the process and the U.S. continuing along with the process as long as it doesn't affect American companies? It is true that for Pillar 2, the question of the coexistence between Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 uh, has been raised by the U.S. and, and by uh, the U.S. business and by many countries. Um, the U.S initiated a global minimum tax with guilty. And I think everybody knows and would recognize that uh, expecting that Congress would change guilty to align with a no ECD global minimum tax would not be that realistic uh, immediately. Finally, uh, when you look at guilty, the rate may look low, with 10%, with an increase of to 16%, I never know when, I think it's 25, 26, 19, uh, 2025 or 26. Um, but guilty is pretty robust. And actually it's probably more robust than it intended to be because the expense allocation rule is such as companies which have an effective tax rate on average significantly above 10% are still submitted to guilty payments. So the US, I think, legitimately raised the question of, well, if you guys do income inclusion rules, try to do them well, avoid the mistakes we may have made, and that impacted the design of the income inclusion rule, but they also said, well, the profits which will be subject to guilty should they be exposed to under tax payment rules. 
when they go to the US? And, and I think the answer is, well, that's a very good question. Let's look at it. And, and indeed, the US support for Pilot 2, which exists, which has its own logic, uh, in particular leveling the playing field, I think would logically be uh, subjected to, uh, we have a regime which is equivalent to what you want to do, subject to <clears throat> the final parameters to be agreed upon in the rate uh, of the global minimum tax, the globe um, um, rule. But um, if it is the case, then I would expect the US to ask for um, uh, being considered as, as deemed, uh, to be deemed compliant so that there would be no under tax payment rule. I was careful not to use the word grandfather because you may not know, and I didn't until yesterday, but uh, I was uh, informed, I checked, and it's true that grandfather actually has a pretty uh, nasty history uh, coming back from uh, slavery. Uh, it was a way to deprive uh, black uh, people in the Southern states of the US of their right to vote uh, because of a grandfathering. If their grandfathers were not uh, free citizens, then the grandkids couldn't vote. So we'll try to avoid using grandfathering, even though we all know that uh, it has a special uh, meaning. But uh, so that's why I use deemed compliant or, or, or coexisting, but, but uh, that's the idea. Okay, a couple of other ones. Um, how have the multinationals, the companies themselves, uh, interacted uh, with with the process? Have they been involved at all? Has it been collaborative? And also, how have non-OECD countries, particularly China, worked in the process? How has that, uh, as, a, as an OECD employee, how has it been to deal with uh, non-OECD countries as part of this process? Has it been more complicated, etc.? Well, it's interesting you ask the question because for me, the question doesn't even uh, raise because we have built an inclusive framework. These are not words. These are institutions. These are realities. I don't have 37 members. I have 137 members on an equal footing. China is a member. Ireland is a member. You're the same, equal footing. And by the way, I'm a French citizen uh, France being a member of the OECD, but I can recruit people from all IF members. And I have, I don't know, 50 nationalities in my team and so, so including Chinese citizens. So it's, it's really global. So you, you need to, to um, uh, have that in mind. As regards the business community, we never develop rules. We're very Anglo-Saxon for that. We never develop rules without input from the business community. We had a few public consultations, the calendar, the um, um, confinement uh, probably didn't allow us to do as many as we would have liked, but we have contact groups, we have regular exchanges with businesses, the US business community, of course, through USCIB, through the business roundtable, through many other organizations, but also businesses all over the world, uh, in Europe in particular, and in Europe in each and every country. So that's something um, which uh, is, is, is so natural, you know, working with non-OECD countries, because for me, they are like OECD countries, or working with business, because uh, what we do is uh, uh, intertwined with, with the business practice. And I would add, working with the civil society, which is very often very critical, but the more critical they are, uh, the, the, not the more we engage, but, but uh, however critical they are, we engage with them and we need to have their input. So pretty inclusive uh, process, I would think. Okay, with just one minute to go, one more. Uh, David Krohn, who is the co-chair of our economics group here at IIEA, asks basically, does do the proposals benefit bigger countries at the expense of smaller countries? That's one point of view, which I think is not unfair, but, but you need to put that in perspective. What happens if there is no multilateral solution? The ones which will pay the higher price will be the small countries. A trade war or a tax war will make Ireland suffer relatively more than all the others. So at first sight, you may say, oh, a solution again, it's the big countries trying to get uh, together. But in reality, if they don't get together, if they don't reach an agreement, the small countries will suffer. And that's what our impact assessment, which again will be published on the 12th of October, I think shows pretty clearly that um, 
a global solution is not adverse to investment, is not adverse to growth. On the contrary, absent a global solution, you would have a negative impact on growth. And we know that countries like Ireland, investment hubs like Ireland, and you're probably one of the most uh, performing uh, in that sense, uh, would suffer more. So um, uh, whether it's driven by large countries or not, uh, I think it's the interest of all countries to have a solution. And that's why I said we work very closely with Ireland and I would like to thank them for the very constructive input uh, in the work. Uh, Ireland, since we launched BEPS, Michael Noonan, uh, now Pascal Donahue, have well understood that uh, the solution is multilateral or then it's chaos, which is no good for yourself. Pascal, thank you so much for joining us. I think we got a, a huge amount of information uh, brought. We all came up to speed on many of the issues there. And um, thank you for, for joining us. And uh, good luck with, uh, with the, the, the talks and negotiations over the coming months. Thanks thank you. so much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much.